Hi, everybody. We'll start in about four minutes, less than four minutes, as we move on to part 25 of our consideration of the biblical background of the small catechism. We're going to be going on tonight to the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer and uh, leave any prayer requests or thoughts, comments, uh, our greetings uh, in the comments, and I will once again tonight just leave in the comments a link to the online version of the small catechism for you. Hi, Betty. Hi, Deb. I hope you're both having good days. It's uh, just before six o'clock out where you are, Betty. So I hope it's been a, a good day there. We had a beautiful day here. I went for a walk late this afternoon. Hi, Linda. I'm glad you're here too. Good, good. And uh, I hope the air was clear out there in Salem. We'll start here in about another minute. Hi, Rita. I hope you're doing well this evening also. Ah, yeah, and that, uh, Anne makes the comment, I thought the fourth petition would stress spiritual bread more than it does, even more than physical bread. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, this goes to the whole uh, message of Jesus' incarnation. You, uh, you know, the, the spiritual goes with the physical uh, there inseparable. Hi, Tom and Ruth. Doing well today, Rita. Thank you. We're, uh, uh, it's, it's been a beautiful day. And I mentioned just a few moments ago, I took a walk late this afternoon. And as I was coming back, I saw Ann coming with uh, Peanut. So we went out onto the, the disc golf course that sits next to our condo development with Peanut. He enjoyed sniffing <laughs> and eating grass. Okay, let's uh, let's begin, and we once more will start with prayer. God, our Father, uh, we come to you tonight, and we ask that our lives would bring you glory. We ask that you would forgive us all our sins for the sake of Jesus and that in his name, your spirit would come to us anew this evening and uh, renew our faith and strengthen our faith. 
Lord, we pray for all of those who are in need of your help this evening. Uh, lift up a special prayer for uh, a man who will soon be going on a uh, deployment with the military, um, who needs your protection. I pray also, Lord, for uh, our friend who continues to uh, deal with COVID symptoms. And Lord, we pray for all of those who are laid low by this disease. And we pray that we would be um, the recipients of your mercy in the midst of this. We pray also uh, for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. I think especially of the person who served as a church secretary during my time at my previous parish, um, who passed away day before yesterday. I pray you'd comfort her family and her friends. And Lord, we, we ask um, that you would look with favor on all of the prayer requests that we lift up before you individually and collectively. And we lift them to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Hi, Terry. Glad you're here too. So tonight we move on to the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I've got the small catechism here. And so um, here is the petition and Luther's explanation of it. Give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? God indeed gives daily bread to all, even unbelievers, without our prayer. But we pray in this petition that he would help us to recognize this so that we would receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. So once again, what Luther is emphasizing is the uh, sovereignty of God. Um, God is going to provide the things for which we pray. The only question is, whether we will receive it with thanksgiving and an and acknowledgement of God as the giver. I suppose the other question is, and we, we talked about this a little bit before, uh, whether or not we're going to be willing to share the bounties uh, that God gives to us. Um, every child who starves in the world um, is uh, an indication that we're not sharing either the capacity to farm or uh, the product of our farming with the world. Um, and I'm not laying that at the feet of farmers. I'm laying that at the feet of, of uh, you know, kind of our economic system and also the limitations of our vision uh, to see that every person on this planet uh, is our neighbor. So then Luther goes on and he asks the question, what is meant by daily bread? Daily bread includes everything required to meet our earthly needs, such as food, drink, clothing, home, property, employment, necessities, devout parents, children, and communities, honest and faithful authorities, good government, seasonable weather, peace, health, and orderly society, a good reputation, true friends and neighbors, and the like. And just a few moments ago uh, said, you know, it was kind of surprising to her that in his explanation of things, Luther was so, I'm going to put words in your mouth here, I hope this is not a bad paraphrase, and so earthy, uh, and not speaking so much in terms of uh, spiritual bread. Um, now, we know that Jesus talks about spiritual bread. For example, when he is at the well at Sychar uh, in John chapter 4, and he's had this conversation with the woman at the well and the disciples uh, who have gone back, uh, have gone into the village and come back to him, and they say something to him about having bread, and he says, I have bread you know nothing of. And then they thought, well, the woman must have given him bread. <laughs> 
Um, whereas what Jesus was really speaking of at that moment was spiritual bread. That is sustenance from God, a sustenance of faith and hope and all of that. Uh, sustenance to face temptation, all of the things that God gives to us to sustain us in the Christian life. But remember, God made us as material beings. And when we uh, were saved by him through his cross and resurrection, he saved not just our spirits, he saved our whole being. So at the last day, our whole being will be raised again in glorified bodies. Uh, so God cares about this fleshy stuff and what we need uh, to sustain physical life in the world. Uh, C.S. Lewis has a, a really um, beautiful way of putting it in mere Christianity. He says, God doesn't hate matter because, uh, I mean, in the history of Christianity, there have been people who said, well, God doesn't care about, you know, any of any of the stuff we do with our physical bodies or what happens with our physical bodies. He just cares about our spirits. And Lewis says, uh, God doesn't disdain matter. He made it. He invented it. <laughs> right. He invented this world with materiality, uh, flesh and and uh, animal life and plant life and water and all of the rest. So um, uh, God recognizes our need for physical as well as spiritual sustenance. And for God, they go together. So like when Jesus is talking to the disciples, you remember they came to him after he had um, uh, been dealing with the crowd all day long. And they say, you know, send them away. And along the way, they can buy food because they're, you know, they're growing faint. They've been with you for hours. I used to think that this was the disciples disdaining the crowds. But in fact, they were expressing concern to the extent that they were able to see, uh, you know, they, they were only expressing uh, what they were able to envision and all they were able to envision being a compassionate thing for Jesus to do was to send them away so that, you know, they would leave Jesus and quit listening to him for, for that time and go home and buy food along the way. And what does Jesus say to them? You feed them. So the call of the church is to feed people in every which way, right? Um, and in, in fact, when we feed people physically, when we provide for their physical needs, like we do through disaster response, uh, Rita, um, we earn the right also then to share the good news of Jesus with them. In the same way that Jesus' miracles and signs open people to believing that he was the Messiah, when we act to address people's physical needs in the name of Jesus and by the power of Jesus, it earns us the right then to share the gospel with them. Why are you doing this for me? Because we follow a Savior named Jesus. Okay, Rita says, when Justin was little and I was teaching him in the Lord's Prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, he said, give us this day our daily cheese. I said, it is daily bread. He said, but I like cheese better. <laughs> that's very good. Well, if it works for him, you know, that's a good paraphrase. <laughs> Hi there, Marilyn. I didn't mean to ignore you. So let's uh, move on here and talk a little bit about the fourth petition. So why do we pray for daily bread? Well, we pray for daily bread, which includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of our body, because Jesus tells us to, right? He put it in the prayer. The disciples said, how should we pray? And he said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. And then this petition is included. By the way, this is the first petition in, we, in which we ask God to do something for us. The other prayers are at, uh, asking God to help us acknowledge what he's already doing for us. Here we're saying, uh, give us this day our daily bread. But also Luther does the same thing in this petition and explaining it as he does in the others. He says, God really gives us our daily bread without our even asking, right? Because that's the... That's the sovereignty of God. So Jesus tells us to do this because, first of all, uh, he wants us to realize that our entire life uh, 
And the life of everybody else depends on God, totally depends on God. And I think sometimes, particularly in this American culture, we lose sight of that. Um, uh, we've been taught, you know, self-sufficiency and all of that good stuff. Um, whereas what Scripture teaches is we are utterly, completely, totally dependent on God. Take a look at uh, Psalm 145, verses 15 to 16. Psalm 145, verses 15 and 16. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Now take a look at Matthew 5, 45. This is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 45. And uh, we're going to go to the middle of the verse where Jesus says, For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Uh, if we receive the favor of God, it's not because we're better than anybody else. We receive the favor of God so that we can share with everybody else, right? G, uh, Paul, um, in I think it's in 1 Thessalonians, urges um, the church at Thessalonica, those who had been thieves before they came to faith and were just, you know, babies in the faith. He says, stop thieving and start working so that you can share what you earn with those who have need. Uh, there is an argument to be made that the only reason we work is to care for others. Uh, because in giving us the capacity to work, uh, God has blessed us. And then from, um, uh, from that, we're also supposed to take care of our families and take care of others as well. I mean, that, uh, that's certainly the vision of the New Testament church. Just think, in the church in Acts, uh, we're told none of them said that anything they owned was their own. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but they shared everything in kind. So the idea is that we are blessed to be a blessing. Well, that not only applies then in the physical world, we see it in 1 Peter. Remember, he says um, in 1 Peter chapter uh, 2, verse uh, 9, that we are uh, 9 and 10. He says we're a royal priesthood, God's own people, so that, right? so that you can uh, tell others about the God who's called you out of darkness and brought you into his marvelous light. So that we're not just saved spiritually for ourselves, we're saved spiritually for the benefit of others. There is both an inward and an outward aspect of Christian faith. Well, the same thing applies to the physical realm. God blesses us with the capacity to work, um, uh, to, uh, to provide for ourselves so that we can in turn provide for others. Um, late this afternoon, um, Ann and I attended an online uh, presentation on how to create a legacy, uh, not just for one, you know, our family, but for organizations, agencies, church, uh, uh, the churches and whatever, um, after we die. Um, our call is to find a way to share the gospel beyond ourselves, um, both in word and deed. All right. So Jesus also wants us to receive all of our physical blessings with thanksgiving. Psalm 106 verse 1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. You remember that's that psalm that uses that, his love endures forever as an antiphon all through there, a response to every single uh, line in the psalm. Take a look also now at Ephesians 5, 19 to 20. Ephesians 5, 19 to 20.
uh, slip up to verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I, that, that verse wasn't included in what I, that last verse in what, what I mentioned to you, but isn't it interesting? It says that in submitting to one another, we are, we are submitting to Christ. Uh, that points once again to the um, irreducible connection between love of God and, and love of neighbor and love of uh, sister and brother in Christ. But the main point of the passage is that Paul is saying, always give thanks to God for what he gives. That's the call of Jesus and why he teaches us to pray this petition. Take a look at another passage of scripture. 1 Timothy 4, 4-5. to 1 Timothy 4, Four to five. I better rearrange things here. I'm going to lose all my material. First Timothy four, four to five. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. This is really important. Now, the immediate context, of course, in the New Testament proclamation is to say, to tell both Jews and Gentiles who come from religious systems that regard some things as pure and some things as impure, that is, foods, um, to say everything God made is good. Now, we know that all these good things have been distorted in some way, and death has come to the entire universe because of human sin. But what Paul is saying here is essentially the same thing that James says, which is that every good and perfect gift comes from God, right? It comes from God. The food that we eat no matter how we may misconstrue it with processed sugars and <laughs> all of that. It's as God gives it, it's good. And so our call is to receive it with thanksgiving. Take a look. Oh, that reminds me of the old story of the guy who is out in the wild. And um, he uh, is... Um, confronted by a roaring bear that is just coming at him top speed. And he says, oh, God, please save me. Make, make this bear a Christian. And the bear stops and says, oh, Lord, for what we are about to receive, may we truly be thankful. Amen. And eats him. <laughs> so we're supposed to be thankful. Jesus also teaches us um, uh, to to pray this prayer because he wants us to look to God for physical as well as spiritual blessings. And we talked about that just a moment ago. Take a look at Matthew 6, 33. This is a very familiar verse. Matthew 6, 33. Again, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek God first and trust that he is going to provide for you. That's the thrust of what Jesus says there. How does God provide our daily bread then? We'll take a look. Oh, he makes the earth fruitful. Uh, he blesses us with the capacity to work. I mentioned that earlier before. You know, we can be very proud. Look at what I've done. What I, what I, you know, what I've accomplished in my life. The, the, the retirement I've amassed. Uh, the land I own. The house I have. And you know, that doesn't even take into account that God gave you your brain and your brawn and your vision and your capacity to do your work. So take a look at Psalm 104, 
verse 14. Psalm 104, verse 14. You, God is the addressee here, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth. And wine to gladden the heart, it says in the ver next verse, and oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. So everything comes from God. Everything. Take a look at another passage. We're at Second Thessalonians. And this actually references the passage I'm talking about. I talked about a moment ago. Uh, Second Th Thessalonians 3, 10 to 12. Second Thessalonians 3, 10 to 12. Sometimes when I prepare these things, I look at these verses and then I forget that I've got them in my notes. <laughs> Second Thessalonians 3, uh, 10 to 12. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their own work quietly and to earn their own living. Right? So, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're supposed to use the gift of our bodies and minds if we have the opportunity to do so. And we know that there are people... Um, who sometimes don't have the opportunity to do that. We've experienced very um, fluid unemployment rates through the pandemic, of course. And some people are really flat-footed and they've had to uh, eat through their savings. We understand that happens. And that's a call to the church also in the midst of this um, and to our society at large, of course. But it's a call to the church to look in compassion on our uh, neighbor uh, in these circumstances. The call, though, is to work so that we can provide for ourselves and for others. What does God want us to do for those who are unable to work for daily food? Well, he doesn't want us to be selfish, but to share with those who are unable to work and also to include them in our prayers for daily bread. I think it's really interesting that this petition is first of all, posited within uh, the framework of praying to our Father, um, uh, recognizing God as the Father of all human beings. And then it says, give us this daily, uh, give us our daily bread, right? Uh, it's, it's a prayer for all the world. So take a look at 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. Yeah, I want to underscore that. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are praying for the whole world. So the Lord's Prayer, how often should we pray it? As often as we can. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow. Paul is challenging hypocrisy here to say, on the one hand, I'm a, I'm a believer in Jesus, but then not to provide for one's own household. Years ago, I knew uh, a woman um, uh, whose son was uh, getting married, and she really didn't approve of the marriage. And... Um, when she was invited to the marriage, she did a lot of volunteering at the church. She said, well, I don't know. I've got so many things to do at the church that day. <laughs> and um, that's an example of people using their faith as an excuse to not be faithful. Um, um, Jesus talks about this because there were um, Pharisees. Um, it was a, a law in the Pharisaic code in which a Pharisee could say to their parents, 
well, what I was going to do to honor you, I'm actually going to use to honor God. And then some of them would use it for their own selfish purposes. And what Jesus is saying is you are not um, relieved of your duty to your family uh, when you come to faith in Jesus. Um, if, in fact, we hold Jesus to be our highest priority in life, and not our families, our families will actually do much better because uh, Jesus will put everything in its proper perspective and we will care for our families. Our families are among our neighbors for whom we pray God will give daily bread, in other words. Now take a look at Hebrews thirteen sixteen. Hebrews 13, verse 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. They are not saving sacrifice. There's only one saving sacrifice, and that's Jesus Christ. But the sacrifice of what we have in order to help others is pleasing to God. Why? Because we are using his blessings in precisely the way he intends for us to use them. We are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others right we have when you are walking in the certainty of knowing that you belong in the god in you, you meet in jesus christ and that he's providing for you then you are you have the confidence to share yourself and share of what you have this is a hard lesson for us to learn uh, we have the idea that somehow if i give away then i am somehow impoverished now that doesn't mean we're supposed to give everything away that would you know that's not what god says he gives it to us to provide for us right but um but it does mean that we should give in the confidence that the god who provides us with blessings today will have more tomorrow and that gets into the daily bread stuff but we'll talk about that in just a moment there's one more passage i want you to look at and this one I really want to take a good look at is first John 3 17 to 18 first John 3 17 to 18 John writes but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him how does God's love abide in him? Wow. Right? So it, this is really making the same point that the preacher in Hebrews made, which is uh, our giving, our sensitivity to the needs of others is really a litmus test of the presence of Christ within us. And I confess to you that I must confess to God constantly. Um, I, I, I've never thought of myself as a, as a giving person. And um, uh, I, I repent for that. Uh, and God has had to, and God continues to have to, teach me to give. It's not that I regard myself as being um, heedless of the needs of others. Uh, I, I'm not saying that, but that I, I'm not as proactive about giving, um, you know, taking the initiative to give as I would like myself to be. So I, this is one of those areas in which I uh, talk with God a lot um, and seek his his help so now this brings up this question why exactly does Jesus talk about give us this day our daily bread or uh, uh, the bread for today hi there Ruth yes it is I'm glad you're here um, so what these words teach us 
is to not be greedy or wasteful or to worry about the future, but to live contentedly and in that confidence that I was talking about earlier that God is providing for us and give us what we need. Take a look at Proverbs 30, verses 8 to 9. Proverbs 30, verses 8 to 9. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Now, it's interesting because this is wisdom from Solomon that God gave to Solomon, you remember. Solomon, of course, became obsessed with riches. He was probably the wealthiest king Israel ever had. It's not a probably. He was. And, uh, and the most powerful. Um, it was because of the wisdom that God gave to him. The problem was he became so blinded by his wealth and power that he allowed the worship of all kinds of foreign deities. There were, you know, the syncretism that we talked about before existed. Uh, it, it was awful. When he died, Solomon was cynical, you know. We just read Ecclesiastes. He was still wise, but by that time he's cynical. Why? Because he had allowed himself to be blinded and changed by the world. Here he is, in essence, praying. Now, this is Agur, the son of Jacob, but it's part of Solomon, the wisdom given to Solomon. Uh, it, you know, he's saying, I don't want to uh, be a liar. I don't want to be wealthy. I want just my daily bread, what I need today. And why is that? He says, because if you get full, you then think, well, I'm on easy street and it's all because of my effort. There's no struggle. There's no strain. Uh, there's no, um, there's no lack. And I begin to think it's my uh, my due. On the other hand, he says, you know, protect me from poverty because I don't want to be a thief. And that would profane God. It's an interesting prayer. Take a look at Matthew 6, verse 34. These are words of Jesus. Again, look what we're doing. We're going back to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 34. Jesus says, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. I love that. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I can remember as a boy being upset and worried about what was going to happen the next day. And my, my parents would say, don't buy trouble, right? Um, you know, worry is... Um, is the opposite of faith. I, I, atheism really isn't the opposite of faith because even an atheist believes in something. They believe in not God. They believe in themselves or whatever. Worry is in many ways the opposite of faith because it is doubting that God will provide. And uh, it's doubting that he will provide the daily bread. And what Jesus says here is so interesting. You're going to have enough things to be anxious about tomorrow, right? You know, uh, don't worry about tomorrow today. Now, that, that's not to say you shouldn't plan, right? We should plan. But as someone said, we should have a sense of humor about it. And we should recognize that um, we make plans, but, you know, Remember 2020. 
<laughs> None of us planned for this year. Uh, the insanity of this year. Um, and it just keeps being insane, right? Um, so let today's worries be enough for today and trust that God will be with you when the sun rises in the morning. All right, 1 Timothy 6, 8. 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. Paul writes, But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. That's a pretty low bar, right? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, right? Worry also is, is the fear that God doesn't care for me. Uh, now let's take a look at uh, a parable of Jesus. Uh, Luke 12, 15 to 21. Luke 12, 15 to 21. Slip up to verse 13 because it introduces why Jesus tells the parable. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in in the abundance of his possessions. So here we see the intrinsic connection between this give us this day our daily bread, between that petition and the ninth and tenth commandments, which tell us to not covet. Now read on here in verse 16. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do? for I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store, store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, once again, Jesus here is not talking about maybe having a reserve. He's not, uh, he's not condemning that. He's not condemning planning. But what we see in the fool in his parable is someone who is utterly self-absorbed. He's not thinking about being rich toward God, which, as we've seen in earlier passages uh, we've looked at, intrinsically means also being rich toward our neighbors. He's planning on being rich toward himself and then chilling. And, um, and with no regard for others. And that's... That's covetousness. There's nothing wrong with ambition. There's nothing wrong with advancing oneself in life. Um, the question is, for whom? And uh, how done? In other words, how do we do it? Do we do it with selfishness and covetousness? Or do we do it with the idea of, I'm going to provide for my family. I'm going to give to the mission of God's work in the world. And I'm going to provide for others as well as myself. Huh? Um, so motive is a very important thing in the Christian life. Why are you doing this? I've told this story several times uh, um, to Living Water folks and probably others. But when I was at Okalona, um, probably I was, I'd been there about five years at that time. Um, the bishop asked me to chair the team that um, put together the Synod Assembly one year. And um, 
uh, we got together and we thought, you know, rather than just being this kind of nuts and bolts and um, business meeting, let's make this both a celebration of our faith, a place where we're going to receive the gospel, the word and the sacrament, but also a place where we're going to see, um, we're going to experience and be taught ways of proclaiming the gospel that maybe we've not thought about before. And so we had a prominent uh, preacher. We had the bishop of the denomination, we asked. We also asked John Ovasaker. Some of you know that name. I was there to hear your morning cry. And we also asked Dick Jensen, who at that time was the preacher with the Lutheran Hour. I mean, it was big, 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 big. And um, I was unable to attend all of the sessions because there was an emergency that required my presence at Oklahoma. But I can remember I went there on the last morning, the Saturday morning that ended um, the assembly. And people were just going on and on and on about how wonderful it was. And the, the bishop stood up to, to talk about what a great experience that that we all had at the Senate Assembly. And I confess to you that I sat there and I thought, okay, when's he gonna mention me? I mean, I, I chaired the committee. I, I called all the people and invited them here. You know, the committee I chaired was the one that put all of this together that everyone is so excited about. When's he gonna say my name? I wasn't conscious of that. But I re realized afterwards what was going on. And I can remember my quiet time the next week. I was there in the church office, the old church office there, where I think the secretary is now. Um, or maybe, no, not the secretary is, it's where the deacons are now. And I, I sat in there praying and I was complaining to God that I did not get credit. I really was angry and upset and clear as a bell in my spirit. I mean, I didn't hear an audible voice, but clear as a bell in my spirit. I heard God say to me, who are you doing all of that for, hotshot? What was your motive? Right? Why were you doing that? And I had to confess that while I mostly thought I was doing it for God's glory and to help the church, I was also doing it for my own glory, to have something that I could say was a big achievement on my part. And uh, I had to repent and acknowledge my sin, my covetousness, not of things, but of acknowledgement, of thanks, when all I was supposed to do was be a servant, and serving should have been thanks enough, that the idea that God would use me in a servant capacity should have been sufficient. So that was a lesson I learned about covetousness at that moment. Um, 945. There's quite a bit I want to cover uh, with the fifth petition, so I hope you'll be patient with me, and we'll um, we'll finish our uh, time tonight on the fifth uh, on the fourth petition, and we'll pick up tomorrow night on the fifth. Um, this reminds me, years and years ago, I decided I was going to write a very succinct, basic introduction to the Christian faith based on the small catechism on my blog. And I got through about 20, 25 installments and I never finished because there's just so much to explore. But we will get through this and we're moving on to the fifth petition tomorrow night. And we'll end a little early this evening rather than breaking in the middle of, of talking about the fifth petition. So let's close in prayer. 
Lord God, we thank you for letting us be together here this evening. We thank you for your word that brings the gospel to us. We thank you that you call us to repentance and the result of repentance is reconciliation with you and forgiveness of sins and the joy of knowing that we are yours. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would watch over each of us tonight give us a restful night's sleep and we pray lord that tomorrow we will find ways to glorify you and we pray all of these things in the name of jesus amen uh let's see betty question how do you know where to find these passages well, I'm, I'm drawing them from um, uh, books on the catechism and also then my own reflection on things, Betty. If you get one of the um, senior catechisms or uh, expanded small catechisms that you can get from, um, uh, from uh, Concordia Publishing, um, you can also, and I, I'll, I'll put I'll put links um, in the comments to show you where you can find this stuff. And um, um, I'm leaning very heavily on on this particular one, but also on this one. They're the small catechism with with uh, you know biblical underpinnings in them, and. Also from Concordia, the Book of Concord, the um, the Lutheran confessions uh, about biblical faith. So I'll get links to that in comments um, and uh, get you to the good stuff. All right, everybody. I look forward to being with you tomorrow night, God willing, and uh, have a good evening. God bless. Bye.